Hello, everyone. A very good evening. I am Jhumpa Mukherjee, Brand and Media Manager at Minimax Systems. Thanks for joining us today. As we know, lubricants play a crucial role uh, in keeping the machinery running smoothly and efficiently. Uh, due to rapid industrialization and urbanization in uh, developing economics, uh, lubricant demand is increasing consistently in steel, mineral, and mining industries. And it's a fact uh, that lubricant ages when exposed to heat, air, water, etc. And there are many risks associated with uh, oil change. But do you know the cost of replacement of oil can go up to 40 times the cost of the oil itself? So today we are here to discuss uh, these important aspects, how to reduce lubricant consumption in steel, mineral, and mining industry. And for the discussion we have today with us, Mr. Anshuman Agrawal, founder and managing director of Minimax Systems, and Mr. Yogesh Kumar, head of technical services department at Minimax System. Uh, the flow of the webinar will be presentation by our experts, followed by AMA session, that is Ask Me Anything session. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to remind you all to drop your questions and queries in Q&A box, not in the chat box. There we might miss some important ones. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, over to you both. Thank you so much, Jumpa. So welcome audience. The topic for today is very innovative one and a relevant one as well when it comes to the industrial sectors like the steel sector, the mineral sector, and uh, of course the mining sector. So all these sectors are related to each other, but the applications of lubricants, hydraulics, and other oils, industrial oils, uh, which are used in each of these sectors might be a little different based on the application, based on the area where the lubrication is required, based on the machineries which are operating in these sectors. And that's why it's very important for us to understand the entire uh, life cycle of how the lubricants are being used, which are the application areas where they are being used, what are the concerns related to lubrication, and what is the reason that the lubrication replacement is quite common and predominant when it comes to and the mining. So why the lubricants are being used? That is a big question. And uh, there are multiple reasons to it. Like uh, the first reason is to reduce friction. As we all know, uh, lubrication is required to reduce the amount of wear and tear, reduce the amount of friction between two relative parts where the relative motion is happening. So this can be maybe a hydraulic cylinder, it can be a gear tooth, it can be two mating surfaces like a bearing surface, inner race bearing and the outer race of the bearing and many other translatory motion uh, surfaces where the friction is very high and in order to reduce the friction to between two mating surfaces, lubricants are being used. The second uh, reason why lubricants is used is for contamination control. Uh, because whenever there would be some relative motion, of course, there would be some amount of wear and tear which would get generated, even if the lubricants are being used. So in order to wash away those uh, contamination at the point of generation of contamination, the lubricants uh, play a major role because the lubricants, when it is especially the forced lubrication or uh, hydrodynamic lubrication, especially in those circumstances, the lubricant would always be on a move. And uh, that's why the contaminants or the wear and tear generation particles, they would be washed away by the lubricant from the point of generation. Heat control or thermal control. So whenever there are some moving parts or certain relative motion components, there would be also some heat generated because of the reduced amount of friction also, there would be some heat generated. And in order to pass on that heat from the point of source of generation of heat to some other portion, that's why the lubricants are also used. So kind of a cooling effect or thermal management lubricants are being used. Energy transfer. So when it comes to hydraulic systems, hydraulic systems uh, or the lubrication systems, the energy that is being produced in form of mechanical energy or in form of uh, 
potential energy it is transferred from one point to another because of the application area so that's the energy transfer function which the lubricants are used for especially in the hydraulic systems uh, protection against corrosion so uh, corrosion happens because of uh, formation of acids and uh, corroding uh, chemicals in various parts so in order to uh, remove those parts or remove those chemicals or those components from the source uh, it is very important that we have lubricants because they would wash away all those uh, chemicals from the point of generation and of course motion control motion control is a common term used for the hydraulic systems where you have multiple types of motions required you might have translation motion or reciprocatory motion action for suppose there is a hydraulic cylinder so you require a uh, reciprocation action between the piston and the cylinder suppose there is a uh, actuation which is required for example valve actuation so slight motion sliding motion would be required for the valve operation or even some rotary actuation would be required for certain valves and then there are proper rotary action for example there is a wagon tipler application where the entire hydraulics motor are used for uh, rotating the entire wagon or the entire uh, cage so for that purpose motion control is very important uh, another application of motion control is clamping operation so whenever there are some hydraulic applications where clamping is required so even for those hydraulic oil which is the lubricant is being used for motion control so in all all of these applications wherever the lubricants are being used it's very a uh, vital function for that application machinery and without a proper pure lubricant or a well performing lubricant which is having the highest efficiency these functions of a lubricant can't actually be justified and hence there would be problems related to these functions when the lubricants are not performing to the best of their uh, performance techniques and hence it is important for us to understand how lubricants perform the best what are the issues which are associated to the lubricants probably most of the lubricants which are being used in the industry are replaced or exchanged uh, just because of the reason that their useful life is already gone their uh, performance starts deteriorating if there are certain additives in the lubricants probably they have got lost the lubricant might start at losing its Uh, lubrication properties that is it might start getting oxidized so there are multiple reasons due to which the lubricants start getting deteriorated in performance and as the lubricants go down in performance all these functions for which the lubricants are meant to be used even those functions are compromised so it's important for us to know what are these functions and also it's important for us to know how the lubricants operate yeah naturally explain the points and uh, just a surprise that the same lubricant is performing good at certain time but sometimes we face the issue when it fails like uh, there is a, uh, an actuator which which has to travel from 0 to 100% from 0 to 5% it's not working well then 5 to 90 or 95 it's working well then after that it's not working what's going wrong there is a chemistry behind this and we will try to take this point in upcoming slides so talking about the steel industry where i think lubricants are used in abundant quantity and if we talk about an integrated steel plant or a merchant mill or say partial steel plants everywhere if it's a steel industry lubricant has to be there right from the raw material division to the iron division to the steel division or the mills or the merchant mills lubricants perform important functions in almost all the divisions of a steel industry the type of lubricants which are used also are in versatile mode we have hydraulic lubricants we have general purpose lubricants or the lube oils then we have the high air viscosity grade lubricants like the gear oil or uh, the bearing uh, related lubes and of course when the steel industry is operating there is a captive power plant 
and the captive power plant would have turbines and associated machineries, which again would have the requirements of dupes. So the variety of grades of lubricants which are used is high. And hence, it's important for a steel industry to understand how these grades are different from each other, how these each of the grades are specific to certain applications and why the grade is important for that application. For example, if it is a gear mill uh, or a proper mill or rolling mill or a cold roll milling. So there you have a higher viscosity grade oils, especially the gear oils or many times even higher grades of oils like the 600 CST oil or in some cases 1000 CST oils, especially when it is the case of the mills. And uh, whereas in the other applications like the furnaces, the center plants, or the coke ovens, there you have the hydraulic applications. And these hydraulic applications again become very important because when the hydraulics, the pressure of the hydraulics does not perform well, then probably the functions associated with these uh, furnaces or the coke ovens or the center plants, they also start misperforming. And these are the reasons why in a steel plant, the lubricants has a very important role to play. And we have found that uh, very commonly, uh, most of the lubricants in steel plants don't have a very long life. They get changed very frequently as compared to the other similar applications in say the power sector or the refinery sector. In the steel sector, it has been found that the lubricants have a very short life probably because of leakages, because of heavy contaminations, because of some untoward incidences at the site, the lubricant replacement becomes very heavy. If you calculate the overall lubricant purchased annually for a steel industry, it would be almost the same as the overall lubricant which is in circulation in the entire plant, which gives us a ratio of one is to one, means the entire loop of a plant on an average basis is changed in once a year. The next we have the mineral industry. Where um, one second, I would like yeah. to add that uh, replacement of the oil is normally uh, taken care by the team which test the oil quality and uh, they do the ferrography and many more tests. For the steel plant, especially when we do the ferrography, all the contaminants available in the atmosphere, which are contributing to oil contamination majorly, those are ferric materials uh, related to iron. So ferrography result itself is not sufficient to decide whether oil replacement is required or oil reclamation is required. So apart from the ferrography, we should take care of other tests as well, and then we should assess the oil life. So that gives an indication that uh, oil analysis is a very important part yes. of uh, lubricant usage in a steel industry. And hence, all the steel plants are uh, proposed to have an oil analysis wing or a lab which is in-house so that the test results can be fast. The frequency of testing also can be high and the reports, the trends are all available in-house basis so that the decisions with regards to lubricant usage are taken on a fast track basis. The next we have the mineral industry, which talks about the mineral uh, extraction from various mines and the beneficiation of this uh, minerals. So mostly all the quarries or the sand pits or the gravel pits, wherever the equipment for extraction of minerals are used, these are very highly dust prone zones. Nowadays, the mining has become itself a mechanized mining, a fully mechanized mining in most of the countries and most of the regions. And these mechanized minings, uh, they involve high pressure hydraulics, and sophisticated hydraulics for the movement of various equipment like the extraction equipment, which is the excavator, or the hauler equipment, which is the dump trucks, or even the drills. The drills are nowadays hydraulically operated drill machines. 
and all of these equipment the hemm which are used in a mineral mine they all become very important for the productivity of that mine and as uh, these equipment are very costly the standby is normally not available and hence when the standby is not available it's very important for you to have all of these available whenever it requires to uh, do a production planning these equipments availability is a very important criteria and as we talked about hydraulics plus dust prone zones available around the working of these equipment it is a uh, very important to understand that these hydraulics should have a better reliability yeah rightly said and one point uh, like steel plant i would like to mention here that carbon contained in the oil testing always shows a higher value then uh, normal assumption is there that carbon content is high means oil got oxidized this may not be the true value because uh, suppose we are working in a coal mine so whatever dust particle is coming in the oil through through the breather or through any source will have only carbon particle so those are not generated due to oil oxidation but they are in bond through the air so during the test we have to filter those particles then we have to do the test of oil to assess the real condition of the oil before we take a decision to replace or to sweeten the oil right now when we talk about the mining industry uh so mining industry as we have talked about it has multiple types of equipment hemm which are used at the same time there are uh, mineral beneficiation equipment like the crushers the mills the roller presses and uh, many other handling equipment which are working along with that mining so that the extracted mineral the extracted ore or the extracted coal it can be transferred in a fast track basis in a productive basis to the end use areas and again these equipment are all hydraulic based and when they are hydraulic based of course the cleanliness of the oil the lubricant becomes extremely important and as uh, we talked about the coal dust or the mineral dust which is completely surrounding that environment where these equipment are operating uh, it is highly prone that the dust would enter through the breathers into the equipment tank and it would contaminate the oil not just by a solid particulate contamination but when these particulate contamination they get entry into the hydraulic systems or the lubrication systems even the gear boxes so first of all they contaminate the oil with solids they can further form sludge and if they form oxidation oxidation products in the oil then varnish related products or sludge degradation products and acids all of these would be formed in the oil which would ultimately deteriorate the entire functioning and performance of that lube or hydraulic oil correctly said and uh, uh, the consumption of uh, oil if we see in the case of mining industry is very very high due to some time recommendation of running hours or by the test methods so those recommendations are based on normal situation and those can be improved and how to improve we will see it and also it has been seen that leakages at various mining sites do happen because Very of high. yeah because of the contamination and these leakages are not just important with regards to the operating cost of a mining site but also these leakages of oils lead to pollution the ground pollution out at the mining site uh, which is nowadays considered extremely dangerous so it is not just your operating cost which is getting hampered because of the hydraulic systems not performing well but at the same time you are also contributing to the carbon footprint of the entire mining site so the lubricant uh, right now uh, has got multiple reasons due to which they are to be changed and uh, they are 
recommended to be changed by the OEMs, the HEMM operating companies or the maintenance companies, or they are recommended to be changed by the EPC companies who have established the plant, like a steel plant. And there are multiple reasons to it. Like the first reason is the lubricants become a carrier of contaminants because as there have been too much of contamination from the surrounding dust, from the rear and tear, the lubricants themselves, which uh, they are supposed to uh, have a contamination control, they become a carrier of contaminant in the system. The second is, of course, the loss of lubricants properties and this performance. And a very important factor is the fear because it's written on the manual. It has been a general practice. It has been a habit. So who would challenge that habit and why would they challenge it or why would they question it? So out of fear, a lot of companies, maintenance professionals, they simply change the lubricant because that's the easiest uh, thing or action that you can take. When that manual was written, 10 years back or from the time of in independence, means how, how long we are following the same standard. Nowadays, oil has been improved using the synthetic oil or many additives. So now this has to be a very wise decision based on the real condition, not based on the black and white documents. True. So the risks of oil change, uh, it's not just the cost involved, but also at the same time, there are certain risks which are involved uh, when you do the oil change. And that's why it is important to understand that oil change is not the only solution. There are multiple other ways how you can actually protect your lubrication system. Probably you could do some reclamation, but uh, we go ahead with the easiest option available with us. And that's why it's important to know what are the risks involved uh, when you do an oil change. For example, uh, you dislodge the sludge and the deposits which cause for the leakages. Uh, there are dirty oil restarts because probably you have changed the oil, but you could not do the flushing. So the entire piping, the entire system still is having the mug into it. And uh, when you restart the system, Although you have uh, filled in a new lubricant into it, uh, the old lubricant, which is still there in the pipelines and the loops, uh, that would lead to a dirty oil restart. Uh, and then overcharging and undercharging uh, of the lubricant. So because of that, the failure to open or close a valve uh, might happen. So many other risks are involved as mentioned here. Uh, Mr. Yogesh, if you'd like to elaborate some more. Yeah, sure. Uh... When we change the oil, risk is very, very high compared to running the older oil. Yes, this is the fact. Because when you change the oil, the new batch which were stored in the oil for days, months, year, we don't know. Before charging, do we uh, have a testing method? We test it before charging every batch, every barrel. Then again, the charging is done by the team and the ground level person. Do we have the idea that what is called cross contamination? The pump used for the charging is dedicated to the same oil or it was previously used for any other grade of oil. The one liter of engine oil is sufficient to kill 10,000 liters of lubricating oil. This is the ratio, one is to 10,000. You can assume that a small mistake can do uh, a big disaster. Again, when a system is running continuously, it has some path. When we go for the oil chain, it will disturb the oil how the tank has been drained fully, the new oil will be charged. During that process, maybe the varnish which was stick on the tank surface 
will get mixed with the new oil the sludge settled at the bottom that is just below the draining point can get mixed with the new oil so such mistake can lead to a situation which will be worse than the charging a new oil or even in the safest case we can say it will reduce the life of new oil to that level it is uh, not uh, cost effective change and not a maintenance effective process true so that's why uh, as there are risks involved in every oil change uh, let us understand uh, there is a time for new poll question out here so maybe once we do the poll we can move on to the next topic of how to avoid the oil changes so over to admin if you can pose this poll question uh, do we test every lot of oil before the replacement or top up i would like the audience to be uh, honest in terms of their response so there is a poll question out here okay so you just need to give your response in a yes or a no okay so the poll results are here it's a mixed response from the audience uh there are 54% who say yes they do the oil test before every replacement and around 46% uh, say that they don't uh, do the test uh, before every replacement or every top up so of course the risks as we talked about are there when you don't uh, do the testing on a regular basis probably because the testing facility is not available in house or probably because uh, we are not considering it to be a very uh, big reason for testing so now what contributes to poor lubrication in these lubrication systems what are the sources of contaminations what are the reasons why these uh, lubrication oils they go bad or they, they deteriorate so the first one is the contaminated environment which for all of us is very high because we are working in dust prone mines or we are using uh, uh, or we are working in the steel industry where again the dust prone areas are there uh, the kind of contamination which is available in our atmosphere it's the mineral dust or the coal dust the iron ore dust so all of these are very high levels of contaminations for the lubricants the second uh, source of contamination is the of course the contaminated lubricant itself uh, we a lot of us feel that the new lube which comes into our plant through barrels or some other sources these lubricants are perfectly contamination free but that's a myth uh, it's a known fact that the new lubricant which is supplied uh, in barrels uh, it can't be super clean level it can be at a level which you can use freely without any uh, uh, problems in your lubrication systems you you need to first filter it out you need to first purify it to super clean levels only then the lubricants can be used so the new lubricants if they are not purified of course they will add to the contamination in your system that will certainly not reduce it then insufficient lubrication so when the lube tanks themselves have certain indications of uh, minimum level of lubrication oil in it so if you have uh, less lubricant filled in probably it will not serve the purpose and insufficient lubricant at the point of lubrication or point of forced lubrication it will cause uh, more wear and tear then the wrong lubrication if we don't have a planned uh, lube cell or an area or a storage cell where the lubricants are stored in a proper demarcated manner with proper tagging there are high probabilities that uh, wrong lubricants will get added uh, also because of the reasons that we have we have just one or two 
handling devices for the lubes, the pumps, the filling pumps which are being used for the lubes, they are just common for all the lubes. And uh, many times people forget that these filling systems themselves would have certain lubes uh, within them as a dead quantity. And that dead quantity would add to the wrong lubrication into the system. Too much of lubrication also is bad because uh, people might just fill up the tanks with higher level of lubricant and that would not have any space in the header space of the tanks. So ultimately the breathing in and breathing out uh, activity won't happen. Then the component view, uh, we will very well know that even if the lubricants are used, there are closed tolerances. And because of these closed tolerances, there would be component wears, which would happen at the mating surfaces. Uh, ineffective sealings. So when the seals for the lubrication points or the components are not effective, probably they would be having some leakages points. So from there, the atmospheric dust would contribute to contamination because uh, these seals normally have a sticky nature of lubes and when the air dust goes there, it gets stuck to the seals, which ultimately go inside the system. And that the same is for the damaged seals as well. Uh, so Mr. Yogesh, you would like to contribute something on this? Yeah, just, uh, I would like to highlight the point number two, uh, that, that is uh, contaminated lubricants. Uh, every lubricant manufacturer tries to supply the best lubricant. That is a fact. And how lubricant is contaminated when it is fresh? This may be during the bottling process, during the blending process, during transportation, during storage at our premises where it has to be used. So storage has a certain criteria, it, like it should be waterproof, the oil barrel storage orientation, nine o'clock, three o'clock position of the openings like that. So company or oil manufacturer alone is not Responsible, re, responsible for the contaminated lubricants, but the entire process of the transportation, logistic, storage, and at last the top up or replacement. So these all, all together contributes a contaminated lubricant top up or replacement. So what are the precautions uh, when you're do, doing the lube handling? Uh, we must understand as uh, regarding storage, Mr. Yogesh gave certain uh, hints and insight. So when it comes to the handling of the lubes, we need to understand that there are several contaminants which are available in the atmosphere, which are uh, around the lubricant storage and around the lubricant handling, which need to be taken care of. And unless we are sensitized towards all of these uh, contaminants, it would be not possible for us to handle the loops uh, in a proper manner. So it is like a habit which we have to create for ourselves. And we need to have a sure shot understanding that contaminants would be present. And in order to have a better lube life, the first step for us is to handle them well so that these contaminants can be avoided, they can be prevented to as much extent as possible. So the effects of the contaminations. So we have understood there are solid particle contamination, there are air dust contamination, there is moisture contamination, then there are acid contaminations, there are gas contaminations, for example, oxygen, or carbon dioxide, they entering the lube system. So we have all sorts of contamination in our lube system. And due to these contamination, there are multiple effects which start deteriorating your lube activity. So the first one here we see is the oxidation. So the oxidation happens in the presence of moisture, when there is a heat available, pressure available, and more importantly, when 
these moisture contamination are available along with metallic solid particles. So the metallic solid particles like the copper, iron, or aluminum, when they are present in the loop system, they act as catalysts. So these metal ions, they act as catalysts. And in the presence of these catalysts, the water which is present in the loop system in form of dissolved water or in form of a, a emulsified water, that would lead to the oil oxidation. And the oil oxidation would lead to acidity products like the tan value increasing, acid getting generated, sludge and varnish related degradation products. And these would have further havocs on the systems because once the acid would start getting produced in any lube system because of the lubricant itself. So first of all, the lubricanting is getting deteriorated. It is getting degraded. The lubricant carbon chain, if suppose it's a mineral oil-based lubricant, so the carbon chain will start getting broken and it would start generating some hydrocarbon sludge products. At the same time, there would be acidity which would go on increasing. And the acidity can further cause corrosion. It can cause further depletion and wear and tear of various parts. So oxidation and acid control, these are very important for lubrication systems. Then it comes to the air contamination or the bubble contamination. So these entrapped air contamination, which happen inside the system is not just because of the lube, but because of the entire design of the lubrication system. For example, if the baffles are not there or the return line, which is splashing the lube back into the tank, it is not till the bottom of the tank. Suppose there is a cavitation in the pump, which is happening. So all of these contribute towards air, entrapped air addition in the lube system. So if this entrapped air is getting bursted, when it comes to the surface by itself, there's no problem. But when this entrapped air starts causing uh, a phenomenon like hydrolysis or phenomenon like thermal degradations, and then this entrapped air causing sustained foaming in the lubrication system. So that would be having a long-term effect on the operation of the lube components like the pumps or other sophisticated components. Uh, then we talk about the sludge formation. So sludge, as we talked in oxidation, it's one of the hydrocarbon byproducts. Sludge is highly sticky in nature. Sludge would get deposited to various components and parts of the lubrication system. The sludge, when it gets deposited on a long-term basis, it gets seasoned up and that will cause the varnish. So the last picture which you can see is of the varnish and uh, varnish is like a very sticky, lethargic deposition of uh, golden or other color substance over the surfaces of the shining surfaces of the equipment. And the varnish is not easy to be removed. Sludge probably can be removed by hand, but once the sludge turns into varnish, it is very difficult to be removed unless you have a proper varnish uh, mitigation techniques. So all in all, uh, when the contamination start increasing, uh, that would cause multiple uh, cascaded effects of contamination and it would lead to abrasion, it would lead to erosion of surface uh, deposits, it would uh, lead to fatigue in the systems, then electrical pitting and then valve hunting related problems, overheating at certain surfaces, creating hot spots. So these would further lead to premature failure of the systems. So it has been found that around 70 to 80 percent of premature failures of machines, they are or they can be traced to poor contamination control in lubrication systems. Very nicely explained. And just an open question to all uh, that lubrication is used to avoid any metal to metal contact to avoid any wear out, okay, whether it is case of pump or gearbox, there should not be metal to metal contact, even in the case of ball bearing or general bearing, anti-friction bearing, friction bearing, in all the cases. Then why gear gets eroded? Why 
pumps, teeth, screw, or vents are getting eroded. Why we got scoring marks on the journal? If there is no metal to metal contact, yes, these all the eight points, whatever we have mentioned here, they are the culprit. And they are all only because of contamination of the oil. If lubricant is maintained properly, equipments can run forever. Yeah, this will look very uh, uh, optimistic approach, but this is the fact that if there is no metal to metal contact, there will be zero wear out and equipment will run smoothly, trouble free forever. And that certainly coincides with one of our missions and vision of our company, zero mechanical breakdowns. Yes. So we very firmly believe that when lubrication is doing its uh, perfect functioning, then the mechanical breakdowns would certainly go down to as zero as uh, possible. So what is reconditioning? Uh, what do we understand by this term? And why is reconditioning required? and where is it required? So reconditioning or many people call it in common terms, filtration of lubricant, or people also call it as reclamation of the lubricants. So all of these uh, actually are the same terms, uh, reconditioning, reclamation, or purification of the lubricants. The purpose is to restore the useful life of the lubricant. By useful life, we mean to say, um, Suppose you are buying a lubricant for a certain duration of hours of operation. Do you always believe that uh, the lubricant crosses that amount of hours for which it has been designed to work for? Probably not. Probably in many of the cases, the lubricant's useful life is never met. There might be some instances where uh, people can say that my lubricants has lasted for multiple years, but What's that life of lubricant where the lubricant has certainly crossed 10 years or 20 years, but all the other parts, the lubricated components, the entire system, everything was on multiple breakdowns during that entire life cycle of the loop of 20 years. You have probably changed the seals. You have probably changed all the hoses. You have changed multiple mating surfaces. You have changed the liners of the bearings and you have changed multiple valves, you have changed the cylinders, the pumps, almost everything of that system. So in these circumstances, you can't say that the lubricant has performed to the best of its uh, uh, technique towards the life of the lubricant. And that's why we call uh, it just as a life of lubricant and not as a useful life of lubricant. So in my opinion, the useful life of lubricant would be when the lubricant along with all the other components of the system is not changed for the entire duration. And probably there are no major breakdowns associated with the lubricant system. So that's when we can say that the lubricant has performed to the best of its useful life. Now, why can't that be attained? That can't be attained because of contamination and degradation of lubricant. So the contamination, when it is removed or separated from the lubricant on a regular basis, so that the lubricant's properties are restored or they are retained, that's when we call a lubricant to be non-degraded. And a lubricant can lead a good life. It can lead a good useful life in the entire duration when it is being poured into that lubricated equipment. So why is reconditioning important? It is important because we want to have a useful life for that lubricant. We want to have a better reliability for that machinery. We want to save, we want to gain out of the benefits of the lubricants to the complete life of that lubricant. And the most important fact is think about the environment, think about the carbon emission, think about the overall carbon footprint, which is generated when every liter of lube is being manufactured. Think about the carbon footprint towards the inefficiency or the production losses. So all of them, when combined together, there is a very strong mandate of a reconditioning technique 
by reclamation technique. Here we are not talking about a waste lubricant coming back to life. Here we are talking about an in-service lubricant to be reconditioned, to be reclaimed, to be purified to the best of its purity levels so that the useful life of the lubricants are retained. And where is reconditioning required? So yes, everywhere where you are using the lubricants, the reconditioning activity becomes very important. Really where? Really where we can do reconditioning? After a man, man or person is died, we can do nothing. Let it be a few minutes, few days back. Like uh, when the person is alive, we can do treatment, we can make him healthy and he can lead the life successfully for many upcoming years. So we should not have to wait till this is the ICU condition or emergency condition. We have to take steps much ahead to sustain for a longer duration. So uh, nowadays we are thinking to make our lifestyle very healthy so, so that we can live longer healthy. This is the same condition with the oil. Maintain it properly, it will live healthy for a very, very long time, maybe more than our life. So the reconditioning of the oil, what are the definitions and what is the actual thing? So there are certain myths around and there are also certain actual practices. So what is reconditioning? Re reconditioning is restoration of the in-service lube oil properties. Reconditioning does not mean recycling. Recycling is certainly different. Recycling means the conversion of waste oil waste oil from the system which is already drained out of a system and mostly the waste oils are drained out of multiple systems together and then they are mixed up together and stored somewhere in the scrapyard. So reconditioning or reclamation does not talk about bringing back this waste oil life to a good oil life. It talks about the in-service lube properties to be maintained. So as Mr. Yogesh mentioned, before the oil dies, if you can protect it, that is what is called as reconditioning. Prior to oil analysis report, uh, it is very important to make a decision. Because once the oil analysis report is out, probably the problems associated with the lube are already there. The lube has started deteriorating. So now the oil analysis report is a mere formality because that would just lead to a decision that you can change the oil now and there is uh, nothing left because uh, the oil properties are already deteriorated. So reconditioning activity must be done prior to the analysis reports. It should not be done only after you get the analysis report uh, because th by that time, the time has already gone. It is a saving to the company, the reconditioning activity in actual fact, because it will lead to a better life of your lubricant. It will lead to better reliability of your equipment. So you should not consider it as an added expense or a burden on the maintenance budget. But in reality, it is uh, actually overlooked as an extra expense for the maintenance department. And many times uh, because of this, the decisions are taken wrongly to avoid the reconditioning activity. Also, you need to take care of multiple factors and conditions before you select the right vendor uh, to go ahead with either purchase of equipment or go ahead with purchase of a service for reconditioning. But uh, unfortunately, it's the lowest priced bidder which is considered for most of the plants and that might lead to wrong decision and that might lead to a improper reconditioning of the lubricant. At least said the selection of the methodology or to understand the real issue is a vital part. Awareness is most important from the uh, top-down 
approach top level should be aware as well as the bottom level employee which is handling the oil so if they all are aware there is no need to go for reconditioning or re reclamation even because oil will not get deteriorated but practically this is very difficult it is better to have a, a partner to handhold to guide and to serve now uh, there are a lot of companies who do oil analysis activity and the oil analysis activity is used for taking decisions uh, about oil further continuance or reclamation or reconditioning of the oil but we have identified that in multiple cases the reference values against which these uh, oil analysis reports are uh, recommending or the interpretations are done the reference values itself are not correct and when the reference values are not correct the results which are obtained those results are not uh, you know any worthwhile because the interpretation would always be wrong if the reference values are incorrect the interpretations might be haywire there might be situations where the oil is extremely degraded or dirty uh, just because of the reference values a decision would be taken to continue with the same oil for example we can see here in this picture this is a lubricant uh, which is a synthetic lube a synthetic fire resistant fluid uh, for which the acid number reported in the test result is 1.12 and the reference value is kept as 8 uh, which is normally not the correct reference value because the correct reference value is just 0.2 or 0.1 so if we compare it with 0.1 or 0.2 uh, the actual result is 10 times whereas uh, the reference value is mentioned as 8.0 so as per this report the report was normal and uh, the analysis mentions the used oil analysis shows normal condition for the lube but actually the uh, condition is not that uh in this uh, i would like to add that reference value cannot be mentioned by a laboratory that what should be the value because lab is there to measure the value and what should be the value can be defined only by the oem or by an expert in this field so the sample report what we are showing the reference value was mentioned by a laboratory so we should go with the actual reference value as per the oem manual oem guidelines if it is not mentioned then take opinion of an expert the type of oils uh, which are normally used for the reconditioning so almost all the oils can be recondition the hydraulic oil turbine oil gear oil quenching oil transform oil metal working fluids and circulating oils for the bearing lubrication so reconditioning is not a limited activity and uh, it is possible to perform the reconditioning or reclamation on almost all of the oils there are multiple techniques which are used for doing the reconditioning based on the type of contamination which is present in the lube so the reconditioning is uh, possible using the low vacuum dehydration technique the low vacuum dehydration means separation of uh, dissolved or emulsified content of moisture from the lube then the nitrogen blanketing nitrogen blanketing is used for preventing any addition of moisture into the lube oil system because the header space uh wherein the air is circulating above the oil level that header space needs to be dry it needs to be oxygen free and that's why it is recommended to have uh, nitrogen blanketing technology for the header space of the tank stage wise uh, mechanical filtration is a technique which is very common it is also used uh, by most of the oems because they have uh, stage wise mechanical filters but again it is important to select the correct micron rating 
when you are selecting the stage wise mechanical filtration activity or technology for your loop liquid liquid coalescing coalescing is a technique by which free water can be separated very easily without much of difficulty in the uh, separation bound so these coalescers they are specially designed elements which can coalesce or aggregate the smaller molecules or smaller bubbles of water and they can uh, separate them easily when they become larger bubbles so these coalescers are used for separating the free water or free moisture from the oil then comes tan reduction by ion exchange so if the acidity levels in the oil they go up the tan value going up it can be reduced using ion exchange based resins electrostatic fluid cleaning uh, this technology is a popular one by which the solid particulate contamination can be separated in the oils because of the electrostatic field centrifugal procedure of separation uh, again a very common and famous technology a very conventional and classical one as well and then comes the magnetic separation magnetic separation is used wherever there are iron heavy particles in the contaminant uh, of the loop so all of these technologies they are present for separation of any contaminants from the loops these can be these technologies can be used individually as well as they can be used in groups so when two or multiple technologies are combined together it forms a universal purification system for you a combo purification system for you and it is very essential for us to understand what kind of contamination is increasing in our lubrication system so that we can take the right decision towards the correct technology many times we just go ahead with the wrong selection of technology because some other plant or some other uh, acquaintance plant is using a particular technology but we must understand that every system is different every application is different every oil is different and every contamination is different every scenario is different so hence we must take a, a correct decision a well informed one when it comes to selecting the right technology towards reconditioning of the loops yes very true and the word centrifugal refining is very common across the industries centrifugal technique is no doubt it is a very good technology but for which application is this proven for the hydraulic application or for a normal loop oil application where load is less so we have to select the exact technology as per that particular application maybe inside the single industry there may be 10 12 of different packages of lubrication where maybe all needs a customized solution and that custom solution can work alone common solution may not be very effective in those areas so what are the benefits of reconditioning the first benefit is of course you can extend the useful life of that machinery you increase the reliability of the equipment there are environmental contaminations which can be reduced the cost saved over the oil replacements that also is a very important benefit for the reconditioning the time and effort which you involve in terms of changing the loop the sweetening activity or the the bleed and feed mechanism so all of these uh, can lead to a lot of time wasted for your maintenance team that is reduced waste oil disposal uh, for many plants lube or hydrocarbon wastage is a concern not just for disposal but also towards uh, pollution and environmental compatibility of that plant so all of these benefits combined together are a big reason for which uh, the reconditioning must be considered for various applications so here's the time for a poll question so i would request the admin to share the poll 
question out here. Do we think about the carbon footprint left behind when we uh, do the oil replacement or the top up? Means, uh, are we aware that for every liter of lube which is manufactured, there is a carbon footprint which is generated? And each time we are buying a lube, each time we are replacing the lube, we are leaving behind the carbon footprints. So I request the audience to give their response on this poll question. Yeah, so the audience has responded around 61% say that yes, they do understand. And 39% uh, probably are unaware of the fact that there is a carbon footprint which is involved against every liter of lube which is manufactured. So important for all to understand this uh, point. And uh, whenever you are taking care of any next lube oil change, you must uh, give an opinion on the carbon footprint as well, which is probably getting generated or left behind. So there are certain systems which are available with the Minimac team, which can help towards uh, contamination control. For example, this first one is a mechanical stage-wise filtration machine, which can help to reduce the solid particle contamination from the various types of loops, whether it is a gear oil or hydraulic oil or any other lubrication system. So these are mechanical based uh, filtration technologies. The next is the vacuum dehydration technique, which can help you in reducing the moisture contamination in all the three forms, as, as well as uh, these also have mechanical based filtration which can help you to reduce the solid particulate contamination from the oils. Uh, then we have the dehydration system using the coalescer technology. So as we talked about, there are free water contamination when available in the lube. They can be reduced using the coalescer technique. And these coalescers are extremely fast devices and very less cumbersome in terms of maintenance. These can be used uh, to reduce the water, free water in a very fast track basis on a very higher flow rate basis. And then these are uh, trick systems which have a possibility to reduce the tan value or the total acid number, which uh, probably has increased in the synthetic oil. So these systems can reduce not just the solid particulate contamination and the moisture contamination, but they can also reduce the total acid number or the acidity from the various loops. And then there is a consultancy service which is offered by uh, the Minimac team, which is uh, RELA. RELA stands for Reliability Improvement with uh, Lubrication Assessment. And uh, this technique or this consultancy service is aimed at uh, implementing the solutions, the implementing the best practices of lubrication it is aimed at reducing the overall maintenance cost involved uh, in maintenance for lubrication systems. It is also to design the contamination control strategies because many times you understand that there are various problems associated, but how to have a optimum contamination control strategy is something which is missing out. So this RELA assessment can help you with that. And uh, the major activity around the consultancy is to educate the teams because uh, it's not just the top management or the middle management who are involved in actual work of lubrication reliability, but also to educate the entire workforce in the plant, right from the down the line management or down the line engineers in maintenance teams till the top management, everyone's involvement is equally important. So to educate them, to make them aware of the entire lubrication practices, the best practices is also what the consultancy takes care of. And of course, to control the unscheduled downtimes, because when you have all of these in place, you can actually reduce the downtime. 
you can improve the uptime and the productivity of your plants. A uh, few highlights of the reports which uh, will be produced as a part of this consultancy. So there are various lubrication reception practices uh, which will be talked about the optimization of the lubes because there are multiple lubes in a plant, especially in a steel plant, multiple grades, multiple makes, multiple brands of lubes being used. So a lube optimization strategy can be produced as a part of this assessment. Uh, contamination control strategies. Many times people go ahead with various uh, types of activities for contamination control, but uh, they might be not centralized efforts towards that. So one can actually centralize the control strategy for contamination for the loop. Uh, disposal and waste management, uh, storage and handling. Then the lube room management. Lube room is a new concept which is not present in most of the industries. But uh, as a matter of fact, the lube room has become a very mandatory requirement for various plants nowadays because there you can store various grades of lubes together and uh, you can control those storages. You can have a proper handling device arrangement out there for the lube uh, handling. And last but not the least, the oil analysis program, because without the oil analysis, uh, no reclamation or reconditioning or lube handling can be possible. And hence uh, the oil analysis program, along with the references uh, can be established. So that's all from my side out here because we are running short of time and we need to keep some time for the Q and A session as well. So thanks a lot from the desk of the hosts, myself and Mr. Yogesh Kumar. Uh, over to Jhumpa, the organizer's host. Yeah. So that was a great presentation by our experts. If you want any details of our services and offerings, please contact us on the email ID mentioned here and you can visit our website for more details on our offerings. Uh, before uh, moving to AMA session, let's talk about our upcoming webinar for a moment. Uh, because it's a very important and awaited topic uh, that we wanted to cover. Uh, that is uh, how to earn carbon credits through better lubrication management. That will be on 15th uh, September. Uh, while I talk about this topic uh, a little more, please book your seat by clicking the link shared on the chat box. And as we know, the demands for lubricants are increasing and eventually impacting the environment. Uh, there is a need to balance the increased demand and, uh, you know, the impact of lubricants on the environment. Uh, the world is facing a climate emergency and uh, industries are urged to decarbonize. Uh, our uh, experts will discuss the latest technologies and best practices to achieve lubrication excellence in this webinar. So don't miss it at all. Um, moving to the AMA session. Okay, so let's take the first question. Yeah, I've seen the, there are lots of very interesting questions. We are very yeah, we are time. <laughs> running uh, short of time. So uh, let's take the first question. That is from Mr. Pulkit. A uh, static device like transformer, reactor are recommended for lubrication. If it is recommended, what will be the frequency for that? Uh, all the transformer or static devices are filled with the oil and with the transformer oil filtration machine, we can maintain the oil quality. Mainly there we need to maintain the BDV, that is breakdown voltage. And those can be achieved, especially we have to take care uh, due to high temperature, even it was momentary within the coil, uh, the carbon particle generated has to be removed. So microfiltration system is mandatory. If uh, these things are in line, use the transformer oil till the transformer is alive. Okay. Great. So the next question is from Mr. Amitabh Guha. Uh, why the lubricant has short life in steel industry if cleanliness level is maintained, tested time to time? Mm, this is a uh, 
a bit confusing question because yeah. if the parameters are maintained, then oil will not have a shorten life. The parameters what we are maintaining is uh, like uh, how we are testing and uh, what the parameters we are taking care of, like uh, uh, moisture level, solid impurity, tan value, then what are the other parameters we are checking? Formation of carbon particle and uh, ferrous particle in the steel industry is very, very high. So we need to check the oil on those parameters mainly. Yeah, true. Okay, so the next question is from Mr. Steve. Uh, apart from oil analysis, what is the effect of lube oil filtration in steel plant operations or applications? Uh, apart from the lube analysis. Yeah, yeah. Lube analysis itself is sufficient. If lube analysis is uh, going in well, then uh, Based on the recommendations and requirement, if we take the timely action, then uh, of course, nothing will go wrong. Oil will have very good life. Okay. Taking the next question from Mr. Manish. Uh, we are having a lot of failures of roller bearings due to either inherent uh, bearing defects or due to having been overused. Uh, more than 15 years or due to defect seal or wear rings or poor lubrication. We use AAR approved uh, RR3 grease in wagon. Uh, please throw some light on this. Okay. That's quite a uh, very interesting question. Uh, bearing life is uh, for 10 years. Like L10 basis, we calculate it. Um, stop down hours, running hours like that. So it has to run at least 10 years. And bearing failure in the case of grease lubrication is mostly based on the seal condition. Because whenever we are using grease, we have grease seals. Or uh, if seals are not there, then we have greasing points. So if we are changing the grease at the right time and removing the contaminants, then uh, there should not be a failure. And if a bearing is getting failed in 15 years, we, we should say thank you to the bearing. You run it for so long. Yeah. So the next question is from our friend from Nigeria, uh, Mr. Clement. Uh, he says that please uh, kindly uh, define the word erosion in terms of lubrication contamination. Yeah, erosion, uh, when we talk in the terms of lubricants, uh, wherever lubricant goes and uh, there is narrow passes like bearings, steels, or maybe in the case of uh, resupporting reciprocating moment, uh, moment like uh, piston, cylinders. So we have very narrow passes to uh, flow of lubricant. So we get ultrasonic velocity for the microsecond. So any contaminant which is supposed to pass with so high velocity will create erosion. In extreme cases, in normal cases, ball bearing, roller bearing, yes. One, uh, one case when 16 ball is there, pump is having 1000 RPM, then those balls having 16 times, 16,000 RPM. So the high velocity with low contamination itself is very dangerous. And if contamination level is very high, then no one can save that component. True. Okay, so the next question is, what are the aspects to be considered for selection of lubricant? Example, open area, closed premises. Uh, yes. Selection of lubricant is based on multiple parameters, 
the first one will be the load second will be the temperature of lubricant what we can send to the particular area these two parameter if we take care then third point will come the surrounding in that uh, the storage tank or that component is being placed then fourth component will come tropical condition and this is the neglected area again if the machine is placed on a coastal area and if this is placed in a desert the concept will change once a very humid air one is having silicon particle as contaminants in case of desert so we have to select the lubricant based on the multiple parameters those can be discussed okay. in upcoming webinars or if we get time yeah certainly yeah uh, so the next question is from mr ahmed uh, asif iqbal mohammed asif iqbal how to uh, determine which types of grease should be used type of grease is uh, again dedicated like if you are talking about the nlgi we have triple zero to ep6 so which grease we should use is again condition based if temperature is high we have to go for the upper grade if temperature is very low application is very precise we can go for a very lower grade like 1 0 00 so this is a uh, condition based that cannot be answered straight right okay so the next question is from mr hp kumar singh uh, how frequently need to send the hydraulic oil for test like 6 month or yearly this is not based on the uh, test frequency of the hydraulic oil but this is totally based on the uh, test what needs to be performed like uh, whether we are going for ruler test moisture test mechanical impurities or which type of test we are going to conduct few test need to be done weekly few needs to be fortnightly monthly half yearly or annually so a fixed deadline cannot be defined for oil type but this can be defined on the application okay great uh, so the next question is from mr salgado uh, in steel industry the first reason of too much oil consumption is leakages any recommendation for that to reduce the leakage yes of course uh, just a few minutes back i told whenever there is a high velocity the small particle is sufficient like uh, a bullet fired by a gun that is very small in the size but sufficient to kill a human being or elephant so high velocity system like pressurized lubrication system there we have to take care of contamination especially particle sizes more than 25 microns below 25 microns we can take care so whenever we measure the contamination level based on the nas class 1638 so nas is a composition of five particle ranges and we have to see the distribution of particle that in what range particle is falling suppose bigger particle are more a smaller or less this is dangerous if particles like 5 to 10 microns are more they will not wear out or they will not cause any damage to the system when we are talking about normal hydraulic system they will cause issue in the servo motors so we have to see uh, the test result detail and then we can judge 
uh, what to be done with the oil okay okay uh, so uh, here i am merging two questions um, is there any limitations of reconditioning and what can you tell about the reconditioning of greases for example open gear grease uh, is it doable and practical uh, certainly there are limitation of reconditioning like uh, during our presentation we mentioned it when a person is dead it is very difficult to make him alive so reconditioning can be done up to certain level when certain uh, parameters are under control and few parameters can be controlled in case of grease if application is very huge when uh, tons of grease are in use there we can think about reconditioning but right now from the side of minimac i say uh, we are not uh, very much involved in the reconditioning of grease okay uh, so the next question is from mr ansari is that necessary to change oil on regular basis is there any other way to save uh, using additives see the changing of oil depends on uh, few parameters like uh, what the quantity is to be changed if a bearing housing having 500 ml of oil and this uh, oil uh, get contaminated in few days few months or week it is better to change because recovery of that oil itself is a uh, very expensive process or unpractical way when quantity is very high then yes we have to take a call then um, when to change the oil we have to analyze the parameter every additive we cannot replenish replenishment can be done for the certain additive which gets sacrificed during uh, operations so replenishment of oil for a bigger size reservoir is not advisable ever okay so let's take the last question for the evening um it's from mr alam uh suppose we have waste oil and we want this oil to be reconditioned to reduce maintenance cost but how we will ensure that waste oil will get restored on or not after reconditioning very good question when we call it waste oil normally they are replaced oil what we drain from the system yes you go for the ruler test residual useful life of the oil contaminants are there that can be removed at any sort of time but we have to see the condition of additives then basicity of the oil vi index there are many components those can be tested during ruler test once we do it and we have to analyze the parameters that oil can be reused if parameters are under control even they are beyond control that oil can be used in some other application when those parameters are not really required because manufacturer makes a, an oil for various applications so application to application requirement changes this is a detailed subject and we need much of time to go into it yeah i agree uh, so um, the questions which are unanswered uh, we will answer them and share it in the form of faq document uh, thanks for being a part of this webinar uh, your feedback matters and please fill the survey form uh, after this webinar and uh, don't forget to register for uh, the upcoming one see you again on 15th september thank, thank you. you thank you everyone thank you.